We start this week with an update on the most important nuclear story currently happening in the United States. The follow-up on the February 14 radiation leak at the Waste Isolation Project Plant in Carlsbad, New Mexico. We again speak with Don Hancock of Southwest Research and Information Center based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Don has been a rock about giving us solid information we can trust about what's happening at the WIP site. Don, what is the current status of the WIP site? Well, things haven't changed very much. We still don't know what happened and why it happened and all those important things. What is supposed to happen starting today is that some workers, eight workers, are supposed to actually go underground and physically step back into the mine. They would be starting a process that will go on for days or weeks, most likely, if not longer, to try to figure out what happened and what may be done about it. So these are workers that will be going down um, and starting this process starting today. What kind of special protection are they wearing as they go into this area? They've supposedly been trained and are supposedly will have a variety of protective equipment uh, up to and including two different self-breathing apparatus, one that will last for an hour or so and one that would last considerably longer than that. They will have a variety of protective equipment supposedly that they can use depending on what they actually uh, run into, and they will, of course, have radiation detection equipment and will have also, importantly, detection equipment for toxic chemicals and volatile organic compounds because what's in the waste, the whip waste, is both radioactivity, americium, 241, and plutonium, various elements of plutonium, including 239, but also a lot of toxic chemicals, and so they need protection from and monitoring for, in addition to radioactivity, also the chemicals. So the Department of Energy has said they've carefully trained these people. They are going to be fully equipped. Part of the reason they need to first go down and establish a base camp is to make sure that they have two ways to get in and out of the mind if something happens, that they have good communication with the surface so they can move quickly if they need to to abandon the mind and get out quickly. What is known about the radiation leak? I variously read that it was two isolated puffs of radiation, And I've also read that it's possible that there has been continuous radiation leakage from the site through the vents. How much has been acknowledged by the authority and what, if anything, is known? Well, the Department of Energy likes to talk about this as a one-time event, although their own uh, modeling study that was released in March said that the one-time event lasted for 15 and a half hours. The actual data from uh, what being captured coming out of the underground and before it goes through the filters and then what comes out of the filters is that there have been continuing releases essentially 24-7, much lower amounts, much, much lower amounts since the first couple, three or four days of the release from the data, but there still is contamination coming out of the underground and then being filtered, and there are then lesser uh, amounts of radioactivity, a becquerel or so, coming out of what's called Station B, the filter system, right before it's released into the environment. So the biggest amounts of release seem to have been early on, on February 14, 15, and maybe 17 or 18, but The numbers move around, but they are always, there is always some amount of radioactivity in the underground air and being, and lesser amounts being vented into the environment. But why it happened, how much was really released, how much contamination there is in the underground, how long the release will continue, whether there could be further releases given that we don't know what the situation is in the underground, all of those things are are, uh, unknowns. Has there been any testing of the soil yet? 
the Department of Energy, the New Mexico Environment Department, and the Carlsbad Environmental Monitoring and Research Center are all doing soil sampling. There has been actual information data released only by the Department of Energy on a small number of their samples, which they generally show to be less than detectable levels given the equipment that we're that they're using. Um, we certainly think that it's not credible to think that 21 workers breathed in contamination and the only place that there is contamination is on the workers. There clearly has to have been soil contamination. DOE's own modeling shows that there would be extensive soil contamination um, around the site. So. There is a lot more soil sampling that needs to be done. There is the data on what that sampling shows need to be made publicly available. So again, this is one of the many things that we don't know how much came out and where it is now. The number of contaminated workers are now up to 21, which is four more than when we last spoke. Is that number expected to go up? Uh, we don't know whether it will go up. We know that there are still more than 40 workers that are expect still waiting for results, uh, urine, fecal, or whole body lung count that they have done. There's, in other words, the tests have been taken and the laboratory results aren't back yet. So it certainly is possible that there will be more than 21 given what's still out there. So, yes, we think it's unfortunately possible that it does happen. This is totally unacceptable. There were 13 workers on site on the surface when the release started. There was no reason that other workers should have come in and have been contaminated. And so it's a major failure by the Department of Energy and Nuclear Waste Partnership, the operating contractor, that anybody was contaminated, of course, because there was never supposed to be this radiation release at all, ever, in 10,000 years. So the fact that all the workers who were on the surface at the time that the release was first detected were contaminated is awful in its own right. But the fact that there are other workers who have been contaminated is totally unacceptable. It's been the fastest workers were told that they were contaminated was February 26th, almost 12 days after the event. The most recent workers, the most recent four workers, it was more than a month after the event that they were told they were contaminated after they had been, these four workers were previously told that they weren't contaminated. So this is a continuing horrible case of the Department of Energy and the contractor not knowing what they're doing, not properly informing the workers. And as far as we can tell, DOE hasn't recommended that any of the 21 workers seek medical help. So that's, again, another horrific practice that the Department of Energy seems to be going through right now. So are these workers getting any treatment at all, to the best of your knowledge? I don't know. As I say, the, the Department of Energy has not been totally clear, but in terms of both my inquiries and some media inquiries, it appears that DOE is not recommending any medical treatment. We know that the Department of Energy isn't recommending any additional testing or planning to do any additional testing on their own of even the 21 workers, let alone any of the others. Um, as far as we know publicly, there is no information that the 21 workers are getting their own medical um, treatment. We hope that is happening. Some of the workers are unionized, and there have certainly been discussions among the Steel Workers Union, for example, about the need for medical treatment and independent health advice, et cetera, but we don't know whether that's actually happening or not. The former director of Carlsbad Environmental Mentoring and Research Center, James Conca, has said that WIP will be closed for at least a year, while renowned anti-nuclear activist Dr. Helen Kolnikoff has predicted that WIP will never be able to be used again. How accurate do you believe these predictions are? We don't know, and nobody knows, and the Department of Energy itself hasn't said when or if WIP will reopen. The fact that we don't know any of the basic things that would need to be known, what caused the release in the first place, how to stop it, whether the underground can be decontaminated, how to decontaminate the surface, how to deal with the worker uh, health problems, et cetera. None of those things are known. We do know that there is no instance in the world 
where you have a underground salt mine significantly contaminated with radiation and toxic chemicals. So there is no experience in dealing with this situation. So we're, you know, starting from square one, so to speak. It will be difficult, if not impossible, and also very costly to clean up the underground. Um, based on my 38 years of experience in working with the Department of Energy, I find it virtually inconceivable. I hope they w will decide if they can't do uh, total cleanup of the underground. I hope they will decide not to reopen it. But my experience is they will say they can reopen, they can do some amount of cleanup or putting stuff on the walls to try to fix the contamination in place, and then it would be okay for workers to go back in the underground, et cetera, et cetera. You know, if they're, you know they will be exposed to radioactivity for uh, as long as the site opens, but, you know, that will be acceptable. I don't agree with that, but that's the kind of thing that I think could happen, which is why I and many other people think we need an independent investigation of outside technical people to look at what happened, what can be done about it, whether there can be decontamination, what kind of decontamination options there would be, how to deal with the workers and potentially the public. Uh, as I said, it's a long time after they were contaminated that the workers were told, so therefore they have been in their vehicles, they have been in their homes, they have been in contact with their family members. So we need an extensive screening of vehicles, homes, and family members in my view, but we also need independent analysis and independent medical people, but we also need independent technical folks to look at what happened and why it happened and what kind of decontamination could be done, if any. Don, thank you so much. We will continue to be in touch to get further updates on what's happening at WIP. Don Hancock of Southwest Research and Information Center. One more piece on WIP. The press and government officials in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, population two and a half million and only 200 miles from the WIP site, are anxious about the radiation release. Despite U.S. and Mexican government reports of little or no radiation contamination from the WIP leak, note that there is a difference between little and no radiation contamination, the public doubts about the gravity of the February 14th incident persist due to incomplete contamination data reporting, the slowness in getting all the potentially exposed workers tested and informed, spotty or contradictory statements by regulatory officials, and uncertainties over the origin of the radiation leak and how far an area it has impacted. Back in the 1990s, Ciudad Juarez and U.S. environmentalists from the Rio Bravo Ecological Alliance took a stand against WIP based partly on concerns that the underground storage facility would eventually contaminate the Pecos River Basin and the Rio Grande. If we're not careful, pretty soon people will be going the other way, over the U.S.-Mexican border. 